Thank you all for a very active week on discussions and for getting straight into the conflict in Nigeria. I know for a lot of you, you haven't um, approached this from the international relations perspective to start with because you've been doing uh, more domestic related degrees. So this will be a bit of a stretch in terms of thinking of your own international conflict and how to apply uh, these thoughts. But I just encourage you, even when you're thinking of conflicts like domestic violence back at home, uh, there are some similarities, but also there are some pe peculiarities and some differences in terms of international conflict. So in terms of Nigeria, we've seen that uh, both the greed and grievance model apply, though most people fall um, towards the grievance model as being the most um, explanatory factor when it comes to the different sources of conflict in Nigeria. However, definitely greed is at, as is at play as well. I suppose the question is if you took away the greed factor, um, the sort of unreasonable attempt to um, promote oneself in some way unfairly, if you took that factor out of it and things like corruption, would there still be conflict? And if you say yes, because of the conflict between, for example, Muslims and Christians or different ethnic groups or over, um, over resources, though that probably points more to greed, then uh, that's where the issue comes into play. And of course, sometimes you can have ethnic conflicts over resources as well. Um, so that's another issue. Then obviously we looked at the correlates of war and the Uppsala um, as measures of, of conflict and this is really important and this is one of the main differences why we're not just talking about a bit of an issue between two people over remote control um, versus actual war or armed violence for example and then of course we looked at different types of violence this week you know structural violence armed violence cultural violence so these are all ways in which you can define conflict and the more of this that you can draw on for your reports uh, you know the more comprehensive it's going to be so then just moving into reports just to reinforce the sorts of things that you need to do you need to look at actors of conflict um, sources of conflict a little bit bit about the origins now weeks two and three the learning modules are excellent in terms of outlining ways in which you look at these things. Uh, you do it in report style, but if you go through modules two and three, uh, and then you still have questions relating to the conflict of your choice, uh, you know, obviously come to me, obviously come to me anytime, but I really recommend you have a look at those modules first. Even if you don't actually do the required reading, just look at, at what it says in general about how to um, evaluate what actors are, what sources are, and what the origins of conflict are. Uh, I think it's fairly comprehensive and you're only looking at 1,500 1, words. So, uh, you you know, there's, there's not a chance to be overly creative with it. You really wanna be succinct. Try and also define your conflict in terms of a time period. If it's too overarching, uh, I would suggest 1,500 words. Well, you're gonna run out of them pretty quickly or you're going to be so broad and so general, it's gonna be hard to get the higher marks in terms of the criteria. So have a good look at assignment one, have a good look at the criteria and of course on Monday night at 8pm or for Queenslanders like me, 7pm, uh, I'll be doing a collaborate. It'll also be recorded and there'll be a chance for lots of questions and answers and also just to get you started on assignment two. Uh, that's not a very uh, big assignment in terms of time or in terms of percentage, but do definitely start thinking about groups. Um, you'll see in the discussion threads, there's team one, team two, team three, etc. And that's where you should put your hand up to join in a team. Um, thanks, everybody. I hope to see you in the collaborate.